Hi, welcome to another edition of Design Spark Ask the Expert. Today we're joined by Tektronics and Lee Morgan from Tektronics. Hi, Lee, would you like to say hello to Design Spark? Yeah, hi, Greg. Thanks very much for involving me. Um, hi, Design Spark. I'm really, really pleased to uh, to join you guys today and talk about all things in vehicle networking and automotive trends. Cool. So, Lee, automotive technologies have moved so far uh, over recent years. Um, it, it has become obviously a, a growth area. But modern vehicles are very reliant on the ECU. Why is the ECU so important to modern vehicles? Yeah, it's a great first question. And if you think about the ECU as kind of the brains of the vehicle, um, and you know, most modern vehicles will have multiple ECUs, uh, with each ECU responsible for sort of a subset of the automotive electronics circuitry, uh, for want of a better description. So you might have an ECU that's in charge of uh, a safety aspect. This could be adaptive cruise control, uh, you might have an ECU that's responsible for the infotainment system, which, um, if you're like me and you have young children and you go on long journeys, is one of the most essential systems you'd want in the car. Um, and yeah, in, in each ECU, kind of they have they have various bus technologies, so they not only talk to various sensors or actuators, but they also need to talk to themselves. Um, and the, the data rates, as you mentioned, have you know exponentially increased from. Now, if you go back, say, 10, 15 years ago, kilobits to maybe megabits per second. Now we're talking about gigabits uh, in terms of individual bus speeds, right up to like terabytes worth of information that is constantly flowing um, around uh, the modern vehicle. Yeah. So obviously with uh, sensors and data rates, they help the vehicles to operate smoothly. You know, for example, wheel speed uh, is an input for anti-lock braking modules. And so sensors... Uh, must work in unison to make sure that the vehicle is uh, is uh, is safe. But that reliance on the sensor and data transmission is more uh, more aware now than ever before. Is that right? Hundred percent correct. Yeah. So I mean, let's take for example, automotive collision detection. Um, you're doing high speed on the motorway or or the autobahn, depending on where you are in in in, in the world. And you know you do not want those anti-lock brakes or, or the brakes to suddenly lock on if they were to detect the vehicle in front of you. You know the, the wheel speed would be really important in sort of a um, in a high-level overview, a typical closed-loop feedback. So maybe there's a sensor that detects the speed of the vehicle that combines that with the distance, for example. So if you're doing 30 miles an hour, the stopping distance is a lot less than if you're doing 70 miles an hour. So all this needs to be taken into account, and you know. It's a term we kind of borrow from the aerospace industry where, you know, if you remember 20, 25 years ago, it was the fly-by wire, so no more electromechanical controls. Yeah. You know, the, the, current, the, 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 the vehicle of today is very much drive-by wire, so everything's electronic. There's very little electromechanical, um, apart from, say, the steering, and even those are uh, electronically assisted <laughs> these days. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so it's, it's really important for, you know, each safety system to have a lot of sensors and a lot of actuators feeding data in on a real-time basis to um, to sort of enhance those those safety features. Okay, so with obviously modern uh, vehicles and the automotive standards, we hear the term uh, IVN, so in-vehicle networks. Could you just elaborate a little bit more about what that is? Yes, of course. So when we when we use the term IVN, we we talk about sort of an umbrella type of uh, technology, and it's all about the data rates that we have in different areas of the automotive circuitry. So you know we have a low speed um, IVN. So typical technologies would be LIN, um, CAN, uh, and FlexRay. So LIN would operate anywhere between one and twenty kilobits per second. Uh, LIN is a very robust technology. It's also very cheap to implement because it's only one wire. And as mm -hmm. we all know, cost and weight is very important in the automotive world. Um, and if you move up to CAN then, so that can, well, with the implementation of CAN FD and soon to be CAN Excel as well, uh, we have data rates now up to sort of 10 megabits per second in theory. And those are two wire um, standard implementation. It could be either shielded or unshielded twisted pair. Uh, again, very robust. And when I use the term robust, I don't mean the fact that the cables are strong and you can swing off them or anything like that. <laughs> what I mean is in terms of electrical immunity to noise, because a modern car, it might not be noisy inside the cabin when you're driving, but electrically, it's very noisy. And yeah. so you need your data communication standards to be extremely um, immune to that electrical noise, because you don't want that data bus or the packet 
packets of data that flow between each ECU to be corrupted. So CAN and LIN are very robust in that respect. Um, and then further up the bandwidth in terms of the low, still the low speed category would be FlexRay. So FlexRay again is a two to three wire uh, technology, but we can get up to 20 megabits per second in terms of FlexRay. And that's very important for some of the modern safety features. And when I mentioned earlier that we were talking about gigabit speeds, now we ha we now have a high speed IVN sort of category, and those are anywhere in you know, higher than 10 megabits per second. But we, it, realistically, we're talking about gigabit speeds. So with technologies such as automotive Ethernet, uh, MIPI, all of those type of technologies that are responsible to bring all the sort of um, if you look at sort of a camera, uh, reversing camera, for example, you know you need real time high fidelity information fed from various points of the cars. Um, I, I know, for example, modern cars have cameras that can offer a 360 degree view to help you park the car now. So mm -hmm. you know, that needs a lot of high speed. It needs to be very good at collision detection. So you don't want to sort of, um, I want to mean collision. I don't mean the physical act of collision, but data collision. So you need these standards to be robust and also have, you know, it, in terms of cabling to be very cost effective. So if you look at automotive ethernet, that's only two wires as well. Yeah, that's a good point you make about the, the data collision there because data rates have risen so significantly in recent years, you know, due to the capabilities of the technology. But many of the systems within the car are still those legacy systems. And would you, would you agree that they're perhaps still more widely used than maybe people think? And is there anything more you could tell us about these legacy termed comms? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, if we look at sort of each ECU, so I mentioned earlier that there were multiple ECUs um, in a vehicle and each ECU would be talking to each other and that would be a high bandwidth requirement. So then then we're talking about our automotive Ethernet type of technologies. But the most important part is the sensors to the actual to the sensors to the actual ECUs. They need to be completely accurate because they are often feeding in. You know, even if we look at um, a very simple application like electric windows, for example. So you may have um, the actual switch, which you know, you, you're driving your car and you want to put the window down. So the actual switch that you're pressing to lower that window, that might go to a CAN circuit, or so the, it's CAN from the switch up until the ECU, but then the ECU might feed that to a LIN circuit because all it needs to do is tell a motor to go down or up or left mm -hmm. or right, or depending on which way the motor is, is configured. So then that circuitry needs to be extremely robust, but also you'd have a sensor to make sure, for example, if you had anything in the way of the window when it was coming up, you wouldn't want to trap your finger. So you'd also have some safety aspects of that. And those signals have to be really, really robust. And in terms of legacy standards you're not going to spend a fortune on that technology because an electric window for example is a relatively simple aspect and people automatically expect that to work yeah. but if you turn that on its head and say look at something like uh, collision detection you know a lot of those type of safety signals might use flex ray and so we see the vast majority of automotive engineers still using low speed serial standards and, and they're essential to be able to um, ensure that the safety aspects of the car work you know and also have redundancy built in as well because mm -hmm. i think in terms of safety and i always remember when i bought my first car um my father always told me it doesn't matter how fast it goes what matters is if you can drive it in a straight line and <laughs> stop it when you need to so yeah. i think what he was referring to was safety first <laughs> absolutely so make sure those work before you worry about anything else cool so just in, in terms of products, what, what are we looking at here from the Tektronics range that you can use within this sector then? Yeah, I think um, oscilloscopes really do lend themselves nicely to looking at serial data uh, in any application environment. And the automotive one is, is, is a key part of that. So if you think about how a data stream um, is actually sent along a piece of wire, you know, it's, it's in reference to time. You know, everything has a clock. Think of the think of your own body. The heart controls basically everything else, and the heart rate is essential. Well, you have a in any electronic circuit and you know, or digital electronic circuit, you'll have a clock signal which you have to reference to. And yeah. so, if you if you therefore reference it in the time domain, the oscilloscope is the ideal tool for this. But then you you need to go beyond that. So if you look at modern oscilloscopes, um, most will have the ability to decode those serial buses, and that's vital because then you can ensure that the actual packet data is correct. So if you are sending, um, you know, a, a certain test signal down the wire, you want to make sure that it's received at the ECU stage or, or vice versa. Yeah. Uh, and 
And oscilloscopes also give you the ability because you, you could actually look at it with a standard protocol analyzer. But what that doesn't give you is the chance to look at the physical layer. And so you know, signal integrity is important. I mentioned earlier that uh, automotive environment is a noisy one from an electrical perspective. So you need to be sure that your signal, um, it starts off at say whatever maximum or whatever uh, signal integrity level you get, and it ends up where it should be going at that same level. So you need to make sure that you get you know, very good signal integrity because if the data packets aren't what you think they are, you need to then start debugging and that then when you go to physical layer. Um, and that also brings into the probing solution. So for example, CAN uh, is a differential signal. So you have CAN high and CAN low. Now you can decode them separately and you can do it using single ended probes. So let's say a typical passive probe would be quite um, substantial or, or, or uh, sufficient to actually decode that CAN signal. But ideally, you'd want to use a differential probe. Um, but then you also come on to the aspect of potentially using digital signals. So, you know, mixed signal capability. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we have a unique technology called Flex Channel, which allows you to turn one analog input into eight digital inputs. So if you're looking at a CAN signal, um, coupled with a couple of LIN signals, if you use one of our Flex Channel uh, probes, you'd only take up one channel on the oscilloscope. And okay. then, you can f then you can free up the other channels to look at, say, traditional analog signals like a voltage signal um, or a current signal. So I mentioned earlier the electric window. So let's say, for example, you have one CAN signal, um, a LIN signal that you want to correlate as well. So when the user presses the switch, you want the signal to the motor to drive the window down. You can also then look at the voltage of the motor and the current. So you can see if that they all tie in at the same time. So then there's no sort of um, timing errors in, in terms of when the command signal is sent to when the actuator um, drives drives the motor. OK, that's a really handy function then, isn't it? Being able to uh, bring multiple signals into one channel. So are there any demos that you could maybe show us about uh, your products in this particular environment? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'd love to set up a demo for you right now where we can look at both the CAN signals um, and a LIN signal coming off um, a particular uh, user board. Great. Hi, I've connected up my 4 series mix signal oscilloscope to, uh, to a test board. Um, I have a variety of signals that we can look at. Uh, one of them is LIN. Um, and if you remember, it's a one wire technology. So a, a passive probe is more than sufficient to look at that signal. And in this case, it's a TPP1000. Um, I've also hooked up the 4 series to the network so we can make use of eScope and um, that's a simple case of putting the IP address into the browser and that enables me to show that on the screen at the same time so you guys can see what's going on on the scope itself. Uh, so okay, I've already captured about 4 seconds worth uh, via a single shot on the 4 series of LIN uh, data stream. Um, on the top part of the screen you can see here's the complete capture and then on the main part of the screen I've actually zoomed in uh, made use of the lovely touch screen and the sort of pinch and zoom capability of the 4 Series to look at uh, some individual activity on the LIN bus. And what I first wanted to look at was, let's take a look at the data rate, because if you remember from the Q&A session, uh, we, we, we discussed that LIN had a maximum data rate of 20 kilobits per second. And the 4 Series can actually tell me what the data rate of this current signal is. So if I just double click on data rate, and this will bring up uh, a measurement badge. Uh, and there you have it. So the 4 series is telling me that uh, we're actually getting about 19 kilobits per second as a data rate on this LIN stream, which is kind of what we'd expect from that technology. So that's really nice to see. Um, another thing we mentioned that oscilloscopes can also decode serial data. And the 4 series is a very capable box when it comes to decoding serial data. And you'll see here, so when I open up the add new bus function, the different bus types is, uh, is pretty comprehensive. And, and you'll recognize some from the earlier session. So CAN, LIN, FlexRay, SENT is another common automotive bus. Um, and due to the top end bandwidth of the 4 series, uh, which is actually 1.5 gigahertz, you're also able to look at some MIPI signals, which again is another common automotive technology, uh, DeFi and CFI in this case. But uh, today we're looking at a nice, very slow speed LIN bus. So if we select LIN, um, the majority of these settings, you, uh, I don't need to um, adjust because I know the settings on the board are fine. So it's version two and the bitrate is correct. 
Uh, channel 1 is my source, so that can stay as is. Uh, the threshold, however, so we need to tell the oscilloscope the difference between the ones and the zeros. So we roughly pick about 50% of the maximum uh, signal amplitude. And so if we look at about 3 volts, that should be sufficient. And what you'll see here is once we set the threshold, the oscilloscope will start to decode in that captured trace almost simultaneously. So uh, there you go. So it's immediately started to de decode the actual data stream uh, from the capture. Uh, you can also look at this in a results table format. So if we head on up to the results table, bring up the bus decode. So if you wanted to look at it a bit more holistically, uh, you can do. And, uh, and if you wanted it in a more portrait format, you can just drag this over to the side of the screen and the screen adjusts itself quite nicely. Uh, and there you have it. You've got then all your data in a table format along with your actual analog waveform. There are a whole host of other features, such as triggering on the bus. We can search for events, um, but check out further videos on that uh, if you want to see those features in more detail. Thank you. Hi. So I've connected up a second signal. Um, I've gone for a CAN low um, signal for channel 2. So um, CAN is a normally differential signal, so you'd either use a differential probe or uh, two single-ended. Uh, but on this occasion, I'm just looking at a CAN low signal using channel 2 and again a TPP1000. Uh, I've already pre-configured my oscilloscope, so I've added the, the bus. So if we've got simultaneous decode of CAN and LIN at the same time. And you can see here, so if you look at um, the, uh, the top serial decode, the CAN, and then the bottom is the LIN, and you can see the analog traces as well, uh, and uh, also the data. So if you take a look at the data rate on the screen, uh, this particular CAN signal is about 500 kilobits per second. If you remember from the Q&A, CAN uh, has a theoretical data rate of 1 megabits per second. CAN FD is, is up to 10. So, um, so it's given us pretty much typical data rate signals, what you expect from, from a CAN decode. And again, highlighting the benefit of using an oscilloscope when you're looking at automotive serial uh, data design workflows. So thanks for watching. Um, if you need any more information, please check out the links below. Lee, thanks for showing us the demo. That, that was really cool. Um, and I really do thank you for taking the time to join DesignSpark today talking to us about uh, automotive and also your products and some of the applications that we uh, we can use with your products. So thanks a lot for joining DesignSpark. No, thank you very much, Greg, and thank you very much for the time, and uh, I look forward to speaking to you guys again.